Tonight, we're going to talk about asthma uh, in a talk entitled, What's New in the Management of Asthma? And so there are three areas that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the first one was the recognition of the middle airway and its contribution to asthma symptoms. The second area is really exciting and it's the area of biologic medicine uh, and talking about new biologic therapies that have been really effective for patients with severe asthma. Uh, and in the last part of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about some new inhalers and new devices. And we know that there's tons of new devices out there and they seem to be coming out all the time. It's hard to keep on top of it all. So I'm going to try and simplify it. And at the end, I'm really excited that I've got a very special gift for everyone. Uh, so all you need to do is email me, uh, just e send me an email um, with an, an address and I'm going to send you a gift. I'm going to tell you all about it uh, at the end. But this is something I've been working on for about two or three months uh, with the other doctors in our, in our clinic. And it's been really useful for us. I think it's going to be useful for you guys. It saves a lot of time in the management of, patient, management of patients uh, with airways disease, whether that's COPD or asthma. I really like to start with this quote because I think it uh, is just so important and just encompasses one of the things I really like about respiratory medicine. Um, it's funny, but you never really think much about breathing until it's all you ever think about. And this is by Tim Whitten. It's so true. When people breathe normally, they don't even think about it. It doesn't come into your mind. But as soon as you have a problem with your breathing, you feel breathless, your breathing slows down what you, slows you down so that you're not able to do what you like to do then it causes a real issue. And if we can help people improve their respiratory symptoms, improve their breathlessness, improve their exercise tolerance, we can have a huge positive effect on their quality of life. And, and that's what I really love about it. And it plays into our, our goal from uh, our practice point of view at Lung and Sleep, where what we want to do is help as many people as possible, improve their overall health while we take specialist attention uh, to problems with their lung and sleep. So the middle airway, um, the middle airway is a bit of a sort of a new concept in, in respiratory medicine. We're starting to recognize more and more how much of a role it actually plays in our patients with respiratory symptoms, especially those with asthma. And so what is it? So the middle airway is essentially the, air, the, the area between the nasopharynx and the laryngopharynx. So we think of the upper airway being the nasal cavity, the sinuses, and obviously the lower airway being uh, trachea and, and bronchi. But the middle airway is that sort of area in between, and it's probably really been forgotten about uh, for, for some time, but it can dysfunction and it can contribute a lot to symptoms of breathlessness, cough, wheeze in patients with asthma and even patients without asthma. And so the most common problem in this area uh, is vocal cord dysfunction. And so what happens with vocal cord dysfunction is that the vocal cords can close or adduct excessively during breathing. And so what should happen is that our vocal cords open up a little bit when we breathe in and they close just a little bit when we breathe out. But what happens sometimes is that they close excessively either when we're breathing in or breathing out, and sometimes actually both. And if that happens, it causes patients to develop shortness of breath, as you'd imagine, but it also causes a lot of wheeze. It also causes a lot of um, uh, breathlessness. And it can really mimic asthma because when you listen to someone's chest with uh, their vocal cords slammed shut and they're breathing through these vocal cords, it causes wheeze. And it sounds pretty much exactly the same as the wheeze that you may expect to hear in a patient with asthma which is caused from their bronchospasm. Um, sometimes it can be detected on a flow volume loop. And in this picture, you can see on the inspiratory loop in the one in the green, uh, there's flattening of the inspiratory loop, suggesting that there's narrowing of the upper airway during inspiration. But on this, one, on this example, the expiratory loop is normal. However, symptoms need to be quite se severe for it to be detected on the flow volume loop. So often lung function is actually normal. And so we can get some clues to this that it may be occurring when you see a patient. And the clues are that often people describe a difficulty breathing in, where normally with asthma and bronchospasm, airflow obstruction is causing difficulty breathing out. It's often worse 
while talking or sometimes brought on by talking. And that makes sense because the problem is at the level of the vocal cords. It often has very quick onset and quick resolution. And so a typical exacerbation of asthma would be maybe a bit of a virus or a bit of hay fever, causing a bit of cough, gradually worsening shortness of breath and wheeze, and gradually getting worse over a period of hours to a day or so, and then taking a few days to, to, to settle down. However, with vocal cord dysfunction, often these patients describe very sudden onset of symptoms, but then completely better again. So they may wake up in the morning and they may be completely fine, but then they get extremely breathless, really wheezy, struggling, but later in the day, they're completely fine again. And that's really sort of typical of vocal cord dysfunction and not typical of, at all of, of asthma. Often can be associated with a change in voice. So patients often describe a hoarse voice, which is a, a really good uh, giveaway sign. It can be exacerbated by strong smells, exercise and cold. We know that exercise can bring on asthma. We know that cold air can bring on asthma. Um, but the typical one is that strong smells. So someone gets exposed to somebody's perfume or goes into a pharmacy and suddenly get the really breathless. The exercise in the cold can sometimes be different as well. And although that can exacerbate asthma, sometimes people do describe, say, just when they're walking, they get really breathless. And that could be potentially a sign of vocal cord dysfunction in response to exercise or cold. As I said, often these people have normal lung function. So if somebody's really symptomatic and sound like they've got really bad asthma, but their lung function is normal, then that's also you know, a really useful clue to maybe, maybe vocal cord dysfunction is contributing to their symptoms rather than just asthma. Because if somebody's really symptomatic, we'd normally expect to see some abnormality in their lung function or in their spirometry. They tend to get some relief with Ventolin, but not complete relief. And the relief that they do get tends to be short-lived. And so the typical story that I reckon that I hear from patients is they use a lot of Ventolin. So they get really breathless. They use a lot of Ventolin, six, 10, 12 puffs of Ventolin, and they feel better, but they're not completely better. But then their symptoms might be worse half an hour or an hour later. Where in somebody with asthma, usually a few puffs of Ventolin after about four or five minutes should give relatively good relief. And that relief, if they do experience it, usually lasts for a period of hours. And so if somebody's taking six or 12 puffs of, as of Ventolin, and then half an hour later, an hour later, needing that again, then that really suggests that maybe this is vocal cord dysfunction. And the reason the Ventolin works for vocal cord dysfunction is that essentially it's just a muscle relaxant. So it works on the bronchial smooth muscle, but it also works on the upper airway, uh, causing relaxation of the muscles, causing the vocal cords to narrow in the first place. And the other clue is no response to prednisolone. So if you have somebody with asthma and you put them on a course of prednisolone, which would be quite appropriate to settle down exacerbation of asthma, and they're not better at all after a day or two or three, then we have to start to think maybe it's not asthma or maybe in addition to asthma, there may be something else going on and vocal cord dysfunction is often one of the, the things that could be going on that will not get response to that prednisolone. And so the key is to to when, when there's not a response or when things are not uh, acting as, as accordingly to what, what it should, then to, to consider some, that there could be something else going on to try and avoid that situation where we get into like multiple causes of antibiotic and prednisolone and having patients not really improving. And the way it's diagnosed is, is this. Um, so to visualize the vocal cords. And so I have a nasal endoscope in my rooms, which I, which I use. And so I'm able to just have a quick look, like similar to what the ENT guys do um, and have, have a look at the vocal cords in real time. It's not a perfect test because sometimes if you examine the patient with the nasal endoscope at a time where they're not symptomatic, the vocal cords actually may be moving normally. And so a normal examination doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have vocal cord dysfunction, but if you do see vocal cord dysfunction, then it certainly confirms that that is what's going on. It also helps exclude other vocal cord pathology, nodules, um, other pathologies of the upper airway, such as thrush at the back of the tongue. Um, occasionally you'll see someone with a paralyzed vocal cord or something like that. Um, so here's an example. So this is the view through um, a nasal endoscope, uh, just sitting above the vocal cords. 
And you can see that here the vocal cords are relaxed open. And what I'll do is I'll play this and you can watch what happens. Just start doing some breathing for us. Is one of our registrars is getting in. the patient to do some dynamic out. maneuvers, breathing in and out. In. You can see the vocal out. cords moving as they should. In. They out. open. In. And they close a little bit. Out. They open. And this is closing it up for me now. In. Out. In, we get the patient to hyperventilate like a bit, to speed up, up the breathing, in, see up, what's going to happen to in, the vocal cords, up, in, up, and in, then up, they're moving in, very normally. In, now you can see the closure of the upper airway, in, and now you can see in, quite significant vocal cord closure in, in breathing. Up, in, up, in, up, in, up, and there's in, further vocal cord closure, and they're in, coming quite, up, quite narrow in, now. Up, Feel like your throat's tightening up. Okay, slow it back to normal for me. And this okay. brought on the typical patients that the in, patient was experiencing in, of wheeze, shortness up. of breath, and also it's a bit hard in, to hear. But you can actually, when you oh, you're finding it hard when we were there, we could tell that okay. there was a change in voice. E and big sniffing. To start doing some breathing for. Uh, so that's typical of vocal cord dysfunction. Um, I use this handout, which is really useful. Um, this is from the American Thoracic Society. Uh, you're welcome to use this. If you just put into your browser, lungsleep.co forward slash VCD for vocal cord dysfunction, it'll take you straight through to that PDF. And I find that really useful. And I give it out to quite a lot of patients. And patients really find it useful just to, just to read through it because they read through it. And often they start to see it and they think, yes, this is exactly what happens to me. And as soon as they recognize that that's what's actually happening to them, they start to feel reassured. And they start to feel that they can, they know what's going on. Um, and then when we start to talk about what we can do to help these people, then uh, they get really good um, symptomatic benefit. The next thing that happens is people tend to develop a dysfunctional pattern of breathing. And so when there's this vocal cord closure causing some shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, or it could be anything else that causes a sensation of difficulty breathing, it can then often lead on to uh, a dysfunctional pattern of breathing. And what I mean by that is that it's a bit of a cascade of events where someone starts to feel short of breath, whether that's because their vocal cords are narrowing or because they've got asthma or they might have a virus that's caused them to be conscious of their breathing. They subconsciously change the pattern of their breathing. And they start using the accessory muscles of breathing. And so instead of just using the diaphragm to breathe in, they start using muscles from across the top of the chest, across the top of the neck, to pull the air into the chest. And it happens because of a subconscious response to that difficulty breathing that they sort of pull the air in from the top of the chest. And you'll see people do this. And they, sometimes it's really obvious because you can see as they breathe in, they pull their chest and their shoulders up and they breathe out and their whole, whole chest is moving where if we're breathing comfortably at rest, it really should be from the diaphragm. And we shouldn't see that uh, movement of the chest. Then what happens is that the respiratory rate increases because they're getting more breathless and they're starting to pull the air in from the top of the chest. This respiratory rate starts to increase. This is associated with anxiety because the feeling of breathlessness is very anxiety provoking. This can cause the vocal cord dysfunction to worsen. So often the vocal cords then further narrow and you can see that they're starting to get into a bit of a vicious cycle. And then what happens is a thing called breath stacking. And breath stacking is essentially stack one breath on top of the other, on top of the other. And if you, if you do that, what happens is that when you're breathing really quickly, there's not enough time to get the air in and out. So you tend to take the next breath in before you're fully breathed out. And if you take one breath in before you're fully breathed out, and you do that a few times in a row, chest fills up with air, and that's what's called dynamic hyperinflation. And when they get dynamic hyperinflation, it causes them to feel tight across the chest. And this is why they often get chest tightness and chest pain. Uh, and it causes them to be very, very breathless and it contributes to the shortness of breath. And then that leads to further pulling air into them the top of the chest. And they get into this real cycle of uh, shortness of breath. And so when, when they uh, sit down and relax and their breathing pattern goes back to normal, uh, then often their breathing will, will relax and go back to normal. And so what do we do about it? Um, the first step is essentially to teach patients to do diaphragmatic breathing exercises. 
And so this is another handout that I really like using that once again, you're welcome to use um, on the URL there, uh, lungsleep.co forward slash DB for di diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and I get people to do this in the rooms when I'm there, I get them to put a hand on their chest and a hand on their abdomen. I get them to take some slow deep breaths in and out while watching the hand on their abdomen and the hand on their chest and see which one's moving more. And often what they'll see is that the hand on the chest is coming out more than the hand on the abdomen. And then what I'll get them to do is relax across the shoulders, relax across the chest, try not to move the top hand, but as they're breathing in, push their bottom hand out with their tummy. And if you push your bottom hand out with your tummy, then you're engaging the diaphragm. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just ask patients, does that feel different? And, and usually always they say, yeah, that does feel different, or that's actually quite difficult. But then if I'll get them to practice that, and I'll send them home with this uh, information sheet that has instructions on the back, exactly how to do this. I'll get them to do it while lying down because that supports neck and shoulders uh, and get them to do it for five or 10 minutes twice a day. And the importance of doing it every day is that it actually subconsciously trains their brain not to go into that abnormal pattern of breathing and to maintain that diaphragmatic breathing. It also teaches them what it feels like to breathe from the diaphragm once again. And so that we, if they do feel breathless during the day or develop the wheeze and the difficulty breathing, then instead of going straight to the ventolin, they can start doing the breathing exercises again and go back to that diaphragmatic breathing. And if they go back to diaphragmatic breathing, their breathing often settles down, their vocal cords relax and open up, and they can resolve their symptoms without pumping themselves full of Ventolin. Because sometimes the Ventolin actually makes it worse because the Ventolin can cause a tachycardia, can contribute to the anxiety, and, and can make that vicious cycle that I described worse. So by going to the diaphragmatic breathing exercise is really, really effective. Um, and, it, and it's free and it's safe um, and, and it works really well. And it also is, it works really well because it's a form of mindfulness exercise for them. So Leah mentioned earlier that we did a talk uh, last week for a group of our patients and community. And this talk was all ab about this. Um, and it was entitled, What are the Best Breathing Exercises for, for Your Lungs? Um, and it was done by Sean Yo, one of our respiratory physicians and, and Leah. Uh, and in this video, that you can check out on YouTube if you're interested. Leah actually takes everybody through some uh, breathing exercises and teaches people how to know if they're breathing properly. So there was a checklist that you could go through to see, are you actually breathing properly? And what if not, what can you do about it to improve your breathing and do some other breathing exercises? And the patients really loved it. And so that's on YouTube. And so if you have patients that have you know, these breathing problems or any breathing problems whatsoever, because people are always going to get benefit from this, you could always send them along and um, uh, tell them to watch this video and they'll get good benefit from that. And it's essentially takes them through, you know, 40 minutes of, of training and, and help. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about uh, is the new biologic therapies for asthma. So respiratory has been a little bit late to the show. Uh, rheumatology got on really on board really early and um, have really revolutionized the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but asthma is also an inflammatory lung disease, which gets huge benefit uh, in some patients from biologic therapies. And so I think it's really important to be, be aware of these and aware that they exist and where they sort of fall in to the treatment of asthma. So that if you do have patients with severe asthma that are difficult to control, that they will be able to... Um, uh, get benefit from these uh, therapies. So I just wanted to describe um, describe this using a case study of a patient that I saw initially back in 2015. And so this was a 61-year-old guy. He was a builder. Uh, he didn't smoke. He'd had asthma since childhood. He was on serotide. Uh, and he had good control of his asthma until about six months ago. Uh, then he had some, probably some infection, and maybe some exposure to dust that might've made his symptoms worse. He was very short of breath. He was unable to climb a flight of stairs and he was very wheezy and had a significant dry cough. Uh, and this was his lung function. Uh, and so his lung function shows that his FEV1 to FBC ratio, which is a measure of uh, whether there's airflow obstruction was 61%. So what that means, when that's less than 70%, that means there's airflow obstruction. And so he had airflow obstruction. His FEV1 was 56% of predicted. So that's a moderate degree of airflow obstruction. But after the bronchodilator, it increased by 16%, which is consistent with a significant bronchodilator response. 
So here in this patient, the spirometry confirms that his symptoms are absolutely due to poorly controlled asthma or suboptimally controlled asthma because there's airflow obstruction indicating that his airways are narrowed. Uh, and after the ventil, and the ventil opened up the airways a significant amount to show that bronchodilator response. And what that means is that before the ventilin, that the airway wall was inflamed, causing it to be narrowed. His gas transfer is normal, 90%, and his gas transfer should be normal because in, gas transfer is reduced when there's disease of the pulmonary parenchyma or the pulmonary blood vessels. And so asthma is a disease of airways. So can, if there was a reduction in his gas transfer, that would suggest that there's something else going on as well. So people with asthma should have normal lung tissue. So this gas transfer is normal. So it's all consistent with somebody who has difficult to control or, or um, severe asthma. So we can do some tests to look at the underlying contributing causes to his asthma. And he had a RAST test or an allergy test, which was negative to dust mite, aspergillus and pollen. His serum IgE, which is an anti antibody related to allergy, uh, was within normal limits. His eosinophil count was a little bit elevated at 0 0.5. Uh, we, I performed bronchoscopy to ensure that there was no abnormality of his upper airway and his vocal cords were certainly normal. And there was no abnormality of his lower airways such as excessive dynamic airway collapse and, the, and samples were negative for infection. So he also had a sleep study because obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which is also a problem with the, the middle airway, uh, can often co contribute to symptoms of uh, shortness of breath and asthma and his sleep study showed that there was no sleep apnea. So we're just going through the process of eliminating other potential causes for his poorly controlled asthma. Uh, management was uh, changed to Simbacort, and it was quite a high dose of Simbacort. Simbacort 400, two puffs twice a day is a very high dose. Uh, we added in Spireva for some additional bronchodilation, and he also required prednisolone. I didn't see him for quite some time, and he, but he represented in 2019, which was four years later, uh, and he was really struggling with his shortness of breath and wheeze. He was unable to do activities that he enjoyed. Uh, he was on maintenance prednisolone by now and couldn't get the dose less than five milligrams. And if the dose of prednisolone got less than five milligrams, he, his symptoms would exacerbate. So it's not ideal um, to have people on prednisolone. We always want to try and avoid that. Um, and this is all despite being compliant with his, his Simbacort. This is his asthma control questionnaire. And so this is just a questionnaire that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, five questions with regards to severity of asthma symptoms. And you can see that he's got a two, a five, 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 and a six. So he's marking quite uh, high up on the severity scale on all questions. So we get to this point where what do we do if um, control of asthma remains in inadequate? And so first thing is to reassess the diagnosis, but in this patient's case, certainly his lung function was consistent with asthma. Uh, we want to make sure that there's not coexistent conditions which may be contributing or impacting his asthma control, such as COPD, and he's a not lifelong non-smoker, so that's unlikely to be contributing. Uh, allergic rhinitis can certainly make patient symptoms of asthma worse, so it's important to control that with nasal steroids. Uh, sleep apnea, as I mentioned, occasionally older patients may have heart failure, contributing to shortness of breath, uh, could have infection. Um, Smoking is obviously going to exacerbate asthma and it's going to be difficult to get good control. Uh, vocal cord dysfunction I've spoken about. Uh, EDAC is excessive dynamic airway collapse. This is where the central airways, the trachea and the main bronchi actually collapse during breathing. And these people tend to get a lot of cough and a lot of mucus retention. Um, dysfunctional breathing, which I've spoken a lot about, um, and also inhaler technique, which I'll come to again shortly. And so we want to make sure that people aren't uh, having a vent on before the cigarette, and we want to make sure that they're avoiding all Kellogg's products, but especially the old asthma cigarettes. And the thing I love about this picture is that it just shows that not at one stage in the history of Kellogg's have they ever cared about anybody's health. Um, we want to try and avoid triggers. So sometimes you can identify a trigger and avoid it, but it's often very difficult. So we might identify that someone's sensitive to pollens, but uh, unfortunately in Victoria, especially this time of year, you know, we, can't, we can't do anything about of really avoiding it. But sometimes we might be able to avoid if we can identify a pet or a bird or, or some sort of exposure at work. So we've gone through the process. We've still got somebody who's poorly controlled, despite optimal management of their asthma. And that's when biologic therapies uh, have, have a role. And so their criteria for use is that the patient needs to 
have been diagnosed with asthma at least 12 months ago. So that there's time to be on optimal treatment to try and get improvement. They need to have been seen by a respiratory physician for at least six months. Uh, the only way to get around that is that if they're diagnosed through a multidisciplinary team meeting, and so the reason that they put that in the criteria is just to make to see if there's something that can be done to improve the asthma control prior to going onto a biologic therapy, in which case it may avoid the need for it. However, sometimes you see someone, I remember seeing someone a couple of years ago, this girl who was uh, a secretary at a general, local general practice, and she was only in her mid-20s, and she could tell that her asthma was poorly controlled, despite her GP doing absolutely everything correct, and she was on a lot of steroid missing days of work, you could just tell immediately that this was someone who's going to benefit. And so the way we can get around that is to present their case at a multidisciplinary team meeting. And we have these meetings at Monash uh, regularly where we discuss cases uh, with radiologists if there's a radiological abnormality, but also with some other respiratory physicians, allergists, and immunologists. And if everybody agrees that it's, the case is appropriate to start a biologic, we can get around that six month wait, which is good. Uh, asthma needs to be confirmed with spirometry. They need to have had an exacerbation requiring prednisolone, and they need to have had a certain amount of prednisolone, suggesting poor control and requiring a lot of prednisolone. And so either a daily dose for six weeks or a cumulative dose of 500 milligrams for people who have had higher doses for short periods of time. And so the first biologic therapy that was available to us was called omelizumab or Zolair. And what this is, was uh, an anti-IgE therapy. So it targeted the IgE sort of pathway of allergic asthma. Uh, and this is now approved for children as young as six years old. Uh, they need to have severe persistent allergic asthma that's not adequately controlled by their inhaler therapy. They need to have an elevated serum IgE, but it only needs to be above 30. And so if you look at the normal range, that's still well within normal range. So it's suggesting that any level above 30 start to being significant. They need to have positive skin um, prick test um, to al perennial allergens, IgE-related allergens, uh, and they need to have... And what, what this treatment uh, results in is a 25% reduction in the rate of exacerbation compared to placebo. So that's a really significant reduction in exacerbation. Uh, and it's also approved for treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis. So patients with a lot of uh, nasal disease as well also get good benefit. And it can, and the ENT surgeons sometimes use this treatment for, for their patients that have primarily nasal disease. Uh, the next ones are anti-IL-5 therapies. So IL-5 is a pro-eosinophilic cytokine. And it contributes to eosinophilic inflammation in the airways, which is often what's driving asthma in these patients that are difficult to control. And the first one is called mepolizumab or Nucala. Uh, and this is an anti IL 5 monoclonal antibody. So the antibody directly binds to the interleukin 5 and it results in a reduction in eosinophilic infl inflammation. It's also approved for kids over six years old. They need to have a blood eosinophil count more than 0.3. And once again, that's not that high because. If you get an FBE and look at the eosinophil count, normal is 0 to 0.5. So 0.3 is actually within the normal range. So it suggests that above 0.3 or above is actually significant. Uh, and once again, this is also approved for chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis. Uh, the next one is benralizumab um, or Facenra. And this is an anti-interleukin-5 receptor antibody. So the antibody actually binds to the interleukin-5 receptor. Uh, this is approved for kids over 12. Uh, it's not approved for chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis. So if, that's the, if patients have nasal disease, then we usually choose one of the other ones. Um, both of these have equal efficacy and they reduce exacerbations by 50%. So this is really significant. And it also reduces the need for prednisolone by 50 to 60%. And that's in the clinical trials. In my personal experience, in patients that I've started on these treatments, the vast majority of them actually don't need prednisolone any longer. And that's one of the main benefits of these treatments, that patients no longer need to take their prednisolone because they don't exacerbate and their symptoms improve so much. Uh, the last one is dupilumab um, or dupixent, and this is an interleukin-4, uh, anti-interleukin-4 therapy, which is a monoclonal antibody which binds to interleukin-4 and reduces both allergy and asthma pathways. And so this is useful for both the allergic and also the eosinophilic asthma patients. And once again, it reduces exacerbations, reduces the need for prednisolone, improves lung function. And it's also used by the dermatologist for atomic dermatitis and also the ENT surgeons for 
the sinus disease and, and nasal polyps. Uh, this is what they look like. They all, they all pretty much come in the auto-injector now. Some, some of you may have uh, seen patients on these and, in, and, you, and actually injected them yourself. It's pretty easy subcutaneous injection and usually patients can be educated to give them to themselves or a family member can give them to them. They're given between every, between every two weeks to up to every eight weeks. So for the patient I described, um, his serum IgE was just a little bit elevated with his ESNFLs were 0.5. And I think that that was probably more significant. So I started him on benralizumab, one of the uh, anti-ESNFLic treatments. And his symptoms improved after two days. And after three weeks, he no longer required the prednisolone that he was on. Uh, and he has not gone back onto prednisolone since. He no longer requires Ventolin. And He's as thrilled as anything because he's able to participate in activities that he hadn't been able to for six years. And the last time I saw him was fantastic, actually. I, I saw him on telehealth and he was on his mobile phone and he was standing somewhere along the Nullarbor on the Great Australian Bight with the most magnificent view of the ocean in the background. And he was just thrilled to bits and just explained that he, there's no way he would have been able to do this before going on to this treatment. And this is the asthma control questionnaire, which shows really significant improvement uh, with pretty much complete resolution of all of these symptoms. So the last section is talking about new inhalers. Um, when I started respiratory medicine, it was pretty easy. It was probably one of the reasons why I quite liked it. Um, obstructive lung disease was broken up into asthma and COPD. And they were pretty much the same because you'd put patients on Ventolin and if that didn't work, you'd add serotide. And when serotide came along, that was a real breakthrough in respiratory medicine. It was absolutely fantastic. And then some years later, we even got Spireva and that was excellent because that gave us an additional uh, inhaler that we could pa put patients with COPD on. And that was pretty much it. However, over the last few years, the um, landscape has really changed. And I know that the pharma reps are coming out uh, strong and fast trying to educate everybody about all of their new inhalers and why theirs is better than all of the others. And it's caused a lot of confusion. It's good in a way because it means we've got more to choose from. And so we can more accurately tailor treatment to patients. Uh, we can choose between different devices. We can choose between different medications and we can um, get um, some good, good results. Um, however, it uh, has caused it to become quite complicated. And so just quickly to go through this, and if you want to download this, I, I use this in the rooms, actually. Like I sometimes bring this up myself because I have to remember. Um, so you can bring it up with lungsleep.co forward slash inhaler slide, inhaler dash slide. If we look at the asthma pathway, first line is inhaled steroids. So we can either use inhaled steroid by itself. And I quite like Alvesco because it's just a once daily, uh, less upper airway side effects. Or we can start someone on as required inhaled steroid with formoterol. And so this is the, the Symbacort uh, as required. The second line is to go to regular inhaled corticosteroid with long acting beta agonist. And these are all of the choices. There's one, two, three, four, five, six now, six different choices of a combination of inhaled steroid be long acting beta agonist. Once they're on this regularly, then we increase the dose until we get to a, the maximum dose. And if they get to a maximum dose of this and still symptomatic, that's when we add in the LAMA or the long acting muscarinic antagonist as a second bronchodilator. Uh, and initially we only had one choice, which was good old Spireva, but now we've got a triple therapy that's available for asthma called Enazare. And so Enazare is the only triple therapy that's uh, licensed to use in asthma. If we look at COPD, first step is bronchodilation. So we start with bronchodilation, and we can either use a LAMA or we can use a LABA. And there's one LABA that we can use on breeze, but there's four different LAMAs we can use for COPD for bronchodilation. If the patient's still symptomatic and they're on just one bronchodilator, then you just add in another one. And so you can, if you're on a LAMA, you add, add a LABA and vice versa. And if you want to change them to a single inhaler, we can use a double uh, bronchodilator. And there are four, four options to use uh, a LABA-LAMA combination for COPD. In patients with COPD, some of them get benefit from inhaled steroid, but it's only those who tend to have exacerbations or have eosinophils in their blood, because they tend to be the ones that get the benefit. Um, and it sort of suggests that maybe there's a component of asthma. So if we want to add the corticosteroid, we can then add them onto a inhaled corticosteroid with a LABA, but we need to be careful if they're already on a LABA, 
up here, we don't want to put them on one of these combinations, or we could put them onto a triple therapy in corticosteroid with the LABA and the LAMA. And now there are three uh, triple therapies for use in COPD. And so that's all a little bit complicated. I'm trying to simplify it as best as possible. Um, but there's one thing I can do to simplify just one step further. And that is to remember that despite the fact that there's like 20 or so inhalers on that slide, there's only really two things that they do. They're either anti-inflammatory in the form of inhaled corticosteroid or they're bronchodilate. That's all they do. And there are two bronchodilators and you can bronchodilate either by acting on the adrenergic pathway by an, an agonist against the adrenergic, um, which is the LABA, the long acting beta agonist, or you can antagonize the muscarinic antagonist, which also causes relaxation of smooth muscle. So there are two pathways which we can relax smooth muscle and cause bronchodilation. And it's just one way we, that we can achieve anti-inflammatory. And so if you think of it like that, then you just need to think, well, does this patient have asthma or do they have COPD? If they have asthma, concentrate on inhaled steroids and then add bronchodilators. If they have COPD, just concentrate on the bronchodilators. And then you can, it's not, this, the slide shows you which ones are licensed for use in which condition, but you can essentially just take your pick and choose the one that you like. So I hope that, that simplifies things a little bit because um, the next thing, of course, is inhaler technique. And with all of these new inhalers, they're, they're, there's all these new inha inhalers out there. We need to learn how to use them all and we need to be able to educate patients. And does everybody spend a lot of time with their patients doing inhaler technique? Probably not. And I think that although everyone talks about it, the importance of inhaler technique, in, in reality, I don't think we've got time. And I don't actually think respiratory physicians do it either. And I think sometimes we probably send our patients to the pharmacist and say, oh, just make sure you ask the pharmacist to show you how to do it. And then when the patient comes back, if you ask them if the pharmacist showed them, but they normally didn't. So this is what we, this is what we did. And this is how we created uh, this idea of um, a free gift, which I've got for you, which I'm so excited about, which I can show you. And so what we did, recognizing that people don't have time to go through inhaler techniques, what we did is that we created these cards to show patients how to use their inhaler. And so here's the one that I've got on the screen here. Uh, it's a nice, nice little card. So this is the one, how to use a meter dose inhaler. On one side is, is a bit of a picture of it, the old fashioned Ventolin with the spacer. And on the other side is, as you can see there, a QR code and a shortened link. And then there's a list of all of the different inhalers that use a metered dose inhaler. So if you have someone that you're going to put on Flutiform or Fostair, you, you, you can give them one of these cards, which is what, what we do, and it takes them to a video. And it's a video of us. And so myself and the other respiratory physicians in our rooms, we all sat down and went through uh, all of the inhalers um, and described exactly how to use the inhaler. Uh, in, in the form of a video. So the patients can take it home, they can watch it with their family because often they turn up to their appointment and they're not with their family and you might even explain it to them, but then they forget and they're not sure how to do it. And so they can watch it with their family. And just below the video is an also an explanation in uh, dot point form to show uh, explain how they do it. So if they've watched the video and they just want to go back and just remember one point, or if sometimes people prefer just to, to read something rather than watch a video, uh, there's also in dot point form uh, how to use it so that they remember all of the important steps with regards to how to use the different inhalers. And so what we've done is that we've done one for all of them. And so I've got the whole set here. This is like, like the complete set. So, so I've got a complete, <laughs> complete set of eight uh, different inhaler devices. And so this is what sits on, on our desk at, at our, in our consulting rooms uh, in Bentley. And, and we take it with us when we do our Gibson clinic. And there's one for everyone. So we've got one for, you know, the, the breeze hailer, the genuine, the elliptor, the respi mat, turbi hailer, the acu hailer, and even, even the nasal spray. And so, so the, the videos are all there on our YouTube channel. You can just check them out now if you wanted to, if you want to go to our YouTube channel or you can direct patients to our YouTube channel. Um, but if you'd like this, what I'll do is I'll send this out to you. So what you have to do is you just have to email me an address um, and I will, I've got a whole stack of these uh, made up. And so I'll, um, I'll, I'll send them out to you. And so you can sit, sit, sit on your desk or in your drawer. And if you have a patient that you want to start on a respiratory inhaler or if they might be on an inhaler already, 
and uh, you want to make sure that they're using it correctly, uh, you can give them one of these little cards that will be able to take them to a video that, that shows them how to do it. And I know the asthma accounts are different, but if you've watched the asthma accounts or videos, they're actually quite boring and I suspect people are probably not watching them. So hopefully you find that useful. So please, uh, I'll get Leah to put, put my email address into the chat and um, just flick me an email, just t tell me where to send them and I'll send them along. And I really, really hope that uh, they are useful for you and, and result in saving time because ultimately uh, we, it's difficult to get back some time. So if we can get back some time um, by uh, helping and while also getting better results for the patients with their inhaler technique, then that would be really good. So in summary, um, just remember the, the importance of the middle airway and in patients with a symptomatic of asthma, consider that this may be contributing to their symptoms. Um, if patients are suboptimally controlled, despite you know, being on optimal treatment and there's not something else contributing to their symptoms, that they may be uh, eligible for biologic therapies, in which case it's, a, it's useful to consider referral to a respiratory physician early. Um, and inhaler technique is really important. But it's time consuming, so I really hope that uh, you take, take use, make use of the, my, my gift. If you don't want me to send this out to you, you can just uh, have, use the, the shortened links and uh, the videos are all there on YouTube.